Hello everyone. In today's lecture, we'll continue our journey with pulse modulation. In the previous lecture, we have learned about one type of the digital pulse modulation, which is the pulse code modulation or the PCM. And we've seen that in PCM, we'll start with an analog message M of T, which is first sampled and then quantized. And the output from the quantizer is encoded in form of binary bits or a binary code word. And we have also said that PCM is a strategy for source encoding, where we start by a message coming out from an analog source and this message is converted into digital form. Once we have our binary sequence of ones and zeros, now we need to answer a question. How can we electrically represent these ones and zeros? Is it positive 5 volts for 1 and 0 volts for 0? Or positive 5 volts and minus 5 volts for 1 and 0? This is a question of what line code we are going to use. So in today's lecture, we'll talk about the line codes. And by line codes, we mean the electrical representation of these ones and zeros. And there are several types of line codes. Each type with its own spectrum, its own characteristics, advantages and disadvantages. And in today's lecture, we'll try to learn about the different types of line codes and their spectrum. The first type of line codes is called on-off signaling or unipolar non-return to zero. In this type of line codes, a symbol 1 is represented by transmitting a pulse of constant amplitude for the entire duration of the symbol. And a symbol 0 is represented by switching off the pulse. So, symbol 1 is represented by a pulse of constant amplitude for the entire duration of the symbol and symbol 0 is represented by no pulse being transmitted. In order to understand this, let's go to our whiteboard over here and examine this sequence we have. Let's assume we have this sequence 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And we want to represent this sequence using the on-off signaling. So, during, and let's assume that this is the duration of one bit. This is the bit duration. So, for zero, if this is the time axis, for zero we have no pulse is being transmitted for the entire duration of the symbol, and for 1, we have a pulse of constant amplitude transmitted for the entire duration. And this is a 1, so amplitude A transmitted for the entire duration. Amplitude 0, which is no pulse is being transmitted. 1, we have a pulse of amplitude A for the entire duration of the symbol, and so on. This is called on-off signaling, sending at amplitude A. For, to represent 1 and amplitude 0 to represent logic 0. And this type is called non-return to 0. Why is it called non-return to 0? Because the amplitude A is, is maintained constant during the entire symbol duration. As we're going to see in other types of line codes, we might go back to level 0 as we're going to see that's why it's called return to 0 but in this case it's not returning to 0 for the entire symbol duration we have constant amplitude either A or 0 the second type of line code is called bipolar non-return to 0 signaling in this type of line codes the symbols 1 and 0 are represented by pulses of equal amplitude, positive and negative. So 1 is represented by a positive amplitude and 0 is represented by a negative amplitude and again for the entire symbol duration. That's why it's called non-return to 0. Let's go to our whiteboard over here. So in order to represent this sequence of bits using the non-return to 0 bipolar, so 
uh, logic zero is represented by a negative pulse of amplitude minus a for the entire symbol duration. One is represented by a positive amplitude a for the entire symbol duration. One amplitude a for the entire symbol duration. Zero minus a and then one zero and then zero one. So in this kind of signaling, one and zero are represented by positive and negative amplitudes a and minus a for the entire duration of the symbol. Again, for the entire duration of the symbol. That's why it's called non-return to zero. The third type of line codes is called unipolar return to zero signaling. Unipolar is similar to the first one, which was unipolar non-return to zero, but this one is unipolar return to zero, in which symbol one is represented by a positive rectangular pulse, but for only half the symbol duration, or half the symbol width. And symbol zero is represented by transmitting no pulse. In order to understand this, let's go back to our whiteboard. So again, let's use the same sequence and let's use the unipolar return to zero. So in unipolar return to zero, uh, symbol zero is represented by no pulse. So no pulse is being transmitted for symbol zero. But for symbol one, we have a pulse of amplitude A, but only for half the duration of the symbol. And then it returns to level zero. So symbol one is represented by a pulse of amplitude A only for half the duration. And in the middle of the duration, it goes back to zero. That's why it's called return to zero. That's why it's called return to zero. And here we have another one. So a rectangular pulse amplitude A only half the duration and then it goes back to zero. And then we have a zero. So no pulse is transmitted. One rectangular pulse only half the duration, zero, zero. And then you have one and so on. This is called unipolar return to zero signaling. So these are the first three types of line codes. Next, we have the fourth type, which is bipolar return to zero. As the name implies, it's bipolar. So it has two amplitudes, positive A and negative A, and it's returning to zero. So basically in the middle of the symbol duration, the pulse goes back to zero, but here is a confusing uh, element we're going to discuss in a second. So in bipolar return to zero, we have three amplitude levels. Why do we have three amplitude levels? Because basically we have positive A and negative A, and in the middle of the pulse duration or the symbol duration will be returning to zero. We have three levels, A, minus A, and zero. So positive and negative pulses of equal amplitudes are used for symbol one, alternatively, and no pulse for symbol zero. So symbol zero, again, no pulse, but symbol one is transmitted as either A or minus A, alternatively. So let's see what this supposed to mean. Going back to our whiteboard over here. So zero, no pulse, one, positive pulse for half the duration, then we will return to zero. Another one, so we will use a negative pulse of half the duration and go back to zero. And this is what's meant by alternatively using amplitudes positive A and negative A for one. And again, zero, no pulses, one, and then zero, zero, and this one will be a negative pulse because the previous one was a positive pulse, like here. So this is a bipolar return to zero. So in bipolar return to zero, we have three amplitude levels. Positive and negative pulses are used alternatively for symbol one. 
and no pulse used for symbol zero and it's returning to zero so in half the symbol duration will return back to zero a useful property of return to zero the bipolar return to zero signaling is that its power spectrum has no dc component and relatively insignificant low frequency components for the case where symbols 1 and 0 occur with equal probability. Here we have one property, one important property actually of this kind of signaling. It's basically saying that it does not have any DC component and it says that it has low low frequency component or insignificant low frequency in com components. Why is that important for us? Let's go to our whiteboard over here. So first of all, since we have positive amplitudes, positive A and minus A, so the positive part will cancel out the negative part. So when computing the average or the mean or the DC component of this signal, it will be zero. So because every one will be the, the, the component and everyone will be cancelled by the next one which uses an alternate amplitude either positive A or negative A that's why the average or DC level of this signal is zero and it has insignificant low frequency components this is important because basically all communication channels or most communication channels would kill the low frequency components it basically would have a frequency response like this. Most communication channels would have a frequency response like this, which is constant or flat for some band of frequencies. And near the low frequencies, it will have low gain. It will kill off low frequencies. And at some certain high frequency, it will kill off the higher frequency. Additionally, um, it's never flat, so the response is never flat, it usually goes up and down like this. That's why we need to use an equalizer or so. That's why we prefer a line code that does not have any DC or low frequency components, because usually the DC and low frequency carries no information, and it's usually a problem to transmit this kind of DC signal over a communication channel. That's why this form has this advantage of low or insignificant low frequency component and no DC signal, but this comes at a price as we're going to see in a few seconds. The next type of line codes is called the split phase code or the Manchester code. In a split phase code, symbol 1 is represented by a positive pulse followed by a negative pulse. A positive pulse followed by a negative pulse this is basically a falling edge kind of pulse whereas for symbol zero the polarities of these two pulses are reversed so a symbol one is a positive pulse followed by a negative pulse so it's a falling edge symbol zero is the opposite so it's a kind of a rising edge Let's go to our whiteboard over here and see how it goes. So, if we have a zero, a zero is represented by a rising edge, so a negative pulse followed by a positive pulse. And then one is the other way around, a positive pulse followed by a negative pulse, so it's kind of a falling edge. And now we have another one, so we need to have a positive pulse followed by a negative pulse another falling edge, zero, negative pulse, followed by a positive pulse, so it's a rising edge, now one, we have a falling edge, zero, we have a rising edge, another zero, we have another rising edge, one, falling edge, and so on. So as you can see over here, every bit is represented by two pulses and the sequence of two pulses will give us the effect of having a rising edge or a falling edge and we have circuits that actually can detect the edge is it rising or falling and in this case we can detect the data we have using these edges so in manchester code instead of representing each symbol by 
kind of a fixed pulse, we have two consecutive pulses. The Manchester code suppresses the DC component, which is an advantage, and has relatively insignificant low frequency component, so it's similar to the bipolar return to zero. Both of them would have no DC component and insignificant low frequency components. And again, as we have said, this is basically important because usually the communication channel would suppress or kill the DC component and the low frequency components. That's why we need to have a line code that's basically not having any DC components or low frequency components. The last type of line code is called the differential encoding in which the information is encoded in terms of signal transitions and by transitions we mean going from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0 or a pulse to no pulse or no pulse to pulse as we're going to see later on so for instance a transition can be used to, to designate symbol 0 where no transition is used to designate symbol 1 so let's go to our whiteboard over here and let's say we have this kind of uh, data so zero would be represented by a transition so let's assume we are starting at a reference level over here with a positive pulse so zero means a transition so we'll be transitioning from high to low level and then we have one one is represented by no transition so we'll keep this level Another one will keep this level, no transition. Here we have a zero, we'll have a transition. Here we have one, so no transition, so we'll keep the current level. Here we have a zero, so we'll have a transition. Going back to this level. And now we have another zero, so we'll have a transition. And one, so we'll have no transition, and so on. So here, you compare every level with the level before. So looking at this received sequence, if you compare this level to this level, you would know there is no transition. So you would know that this bit is 1. But comparing this level with the level before, you know that there is a transition. So you know it's a 0. Comparing this level with this level, you know there is a transition. So you know you have a 0 and so on. So here, ones and zeros are encoded in the transitions we have in the signal or the line code. So transition can be used to designate a symbol zero, where no transition is used to designate symbol one. It's clear that a differentially encoded signal may be inverted without affecting its interpretations. How is that? If you go back over here, and let's assume that this signal is completely flipped. So basically, instead of having a high low, then you have low, inverted to high, and then keep it high, then you go low, and then keep it high and low. And in this case, comparing, you can get actually the same result. So here, this level and this level are the same, no transition, it means we have a zero. Comparing this level and this level, we have a transition, so it's a, a zero, and so on. And that's why it's called differential encoding, because it seems like when you decode this kind of line code, you need to compare this level with the level before to see if we have a transition or not. That's why it's called differential encoding. The original binary information is recovered by comparing the polarity of adjacent symbols to establish whether we have a transition or not. So only compare the uh, polarity of two adjacent, adjacent symbols and you're going to see if you have a transition, so it's a zero, no transition, it's a one. And of course, uh, know that we need to have a reference bit. So if you go back to our whiteboard over here, we assumed we start at level one or high. So we have need to have a reference and this reference need to be known at the receiver as well. So the both the transmitter and the receiver agree we're going to use the reference level positive A or 0 or so on. Now the waveforms, these waveforms we have already plotted are shown here in the slides for this bit sequence and it's important to know that we only use rectangular pulses 
but we can use other pulse shapes other pulse shapes may be used and the pulse shapes will affect the bandwidth of the transmitted signal and instead of using you know, instead of using square pulses as we did over here square pulses will have a spectrum of a sync function which is kind of why it requires large bandwidth but we can use other pulse shapes and use the same techniques the same line codes so here we have the uh, line codes for on off signaling the unipolar non-return to zero or off signaling and b over here is a polar non-return to zero and c is unipolar return to zero and so on and this d is a bipolar return to zero and e is a split phase or manchester and this one is a differential encoding in which we need to have a reference bit okay so let's take a closer look at these curves, at these line codes, and see how would it affect the operation of a system. But before we do that, let me tell you that most of the digital communication systems require some sort of synchronization, which means you need to have a clock at the receiver that's basically synchronized to the clock used at the transmitter in order to, 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 uh, to know where does the symbol start and where does it end. How would you know at the receiver that this is one symbol and this is one symbol and not two symbols? How would you realize at the receiver that this level A with extended duration is actually two ones, two consecutive ones, not just one, one symbol which is one? So you need to have some sort of synchronization, a locally generated clock at the receiver, which is usually synchronized to the clock at the transmitter. And usually this clock is synchronized and this synchronization is achieved by extracting information from the transmitted data sequence. How is that? Let's take a look over here. If you look at this on-off signal, here you have a transition from 0 to 1 and then you have two consecutive ones then 1, 0, 1, 0 so looking at this data you can extract somehow the clock and you can realize that this duration corresponds to one symbol and this duration corresponds to another symbol of course this will be problematic if you have long sequences of zeros or long sequences of 1 if you have long sequence of ones, now you don't have this transition. So you will not, the clock at the receiver will not be having easy time. It will be hard for the clock at the receiver to be synchronized with the clock at the transmitter. So, same over here for the bipolar uh, non return to zero. If you have long sequence of ones or long sequence of zeros, synchronization will be a problem. But look over here at C which is a polar return, sorry, the unipolar return to zero. Returning to zero guarantees a transition even if you have long sequence of ones. Here we have two consecutive ones. So instead of having a DC level for the whole duration, now we are returning to zero. And in this case, we are giving the receiver a way to extract the clock and synchronize the clock at the receiver with the clock at the transmitter. So, in case we have long sequences of zero, this kind of code, the return to zero, the unipolar return to zero will solve this problem. But again, we still have a problem with long sequences of zeros. We will lose synchronization. So, it seems like the split phase or Manchester code is kind of optimum in the sense you will always be having transitions. If you have two consecutive ones, as in this case, you will have two, right, two falling edges. And if you have two consecutive zeros, you will have two rising edges. So even if you have long sequences of ones and zeros, you still be able to extract the clock because you will always have a transition from low to high or high to low. But as we have seen in our study, there is no free lunch. Manchester code has an advantage of 
helping the receiver to make it easier for the receiver to synchronize and have a clock synchronized with transmitter, but this comes at a price, basically the bandwidth. That's why it's important to put this, these line codes in perspective by comparing them in bandwidths as well. So if you look over here, this is a spectrum of the unipolar non-return to zero signaling. In unipolar, we have two levels, zero and A, zero, which means logic zero, which is no pulse, and A, which is a pulse from it, it represents one. In this case, we have an impulse at zero, which is the DC component, and we have significant low frequency components. And again, transmitting this over any communication channel, most probably this low frequency part will be highly distorted. Because again, if you go over here, usually the communication channel will distort or kill the low frequency part of any signal. That's why we prefer to avoid having DC components and low frequency components in our signals. And over here, when you talk about the uh, polar or bipolar non-return to zero, you don't have this impulse because right now, in this kind of signaling, you have positive amplitudes and negative amplitudes. So on average, they might be canceling each other. So you don't have this DC impulse component, delta, impulse, delta, delta function over here. But you still have significant low frequency components. And again, as you can look over here, the bandwidth, which is almost can be assumed to be over here, the first null bandwidth, this is the first zero crossing of a sync function. Uh, it's at 1, which is a normalized frequency, normalized to the bit duration or the symbol duration. So this is basically 1 over TB. And here it's 1 over TB. But if you take a look at line code C, which is unipolar return to 0. So it's unipolar, so you have 0 and A, so you have the same problem of this DC component, the impulse function. And again, you have significant low frequency components, but you have another impulse function at 1 over TB. This impulse function will make it easier to recover the clock because this is the frequency 1 over TB or 1 over the symbol duration, which is a symbol frequency or symbol rate. And if you look at here, as you can see, the first null has moved, here it was at 1 over TB, here it's at 2 over TB, so it's, it requires double the bandwidth. And here comes the price, so if you want to make it easier to recover the clock, you have to sacrifice bandwidth, and so on. And in D as well, which is a bipolar return to zero, here you don't have significant low frequency components, so you, this part will not be distorted uh, as much. But as you can see, we have significant higher frequencies. So again, almost the bandwidth has been doubled. And looking at the last one here, which is uh, Manchester encoded, it doesn't have significant low frequency components, but again, it's almost double the bandwidth. You have two over TB kind of bandwidth. That's why studying the line codes is very important for you to choose between or, or choose a line code that can provide you with uh, good synchronization properties and the bandwidth. And here it's the time to remind you about the importance of Fourier transform and Fourier tools as a way of translating what's happening in time domain into frequency domain. How did we obtain this spectrum over here and these two and these two using Fourier analysis? But the difference is here, here is that these kind of signals are not deterministic signals, they are random signals. Because in general, in any communication systems, we do not know the exact sequence of data that will be transmitted. So instead of knowing a sequence like this one, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, all we know is that a 1 is represented by this kind of pulse shape, amplitude A or minus A, and 0 is represented by this kind of shape, and so on. We do not know the exact signal, but it's known as a 
random signal or a random process. And these kind of signals are dealt with a bit differently than what we have learned in the first chapter in this course. In this course, in the first chapter, we have learned about Fourier transform and it was basically applied to deterministic signals. But for random signals, we have different approaches and different techniques that can be used to obtain this spectrum. Again, based on Fourier analysis, but slightly different. And that's why there is a branch of signal processing that's called the statistical signal processing or random signal processing, where we learn techniques and methods that we can use to perform analysis in frequency domain and other domains on random and non-deterministic signals. Uh, this will be it for uh, today's lecture. In next week's lecture, we will talk about time division multiplexing.